Are we good to start anytime? Uh, yep, you're good now. You're coming in. Yep, okay. I can see attendees are starting to come in, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna mute myself, but uh, feel free to talk when you need to. Okay. Okay, I will start now. <laughs> Hello and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us for this a town hall that's part of the Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations um, here at the University of Pittsburgh. We are in our third year of celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month and we're, I'm so happy to be a part of it. Um, so today we have a really important conversation around mental health of the Latinx population here in Pittsburgh, um, but also a lot of similar cities that are going through a similar emerging Latinx community um, phenomenon. Um, so while it's exciting, we'll see that there's also a lot of difficulties and a lot of work being done to try to improve those. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ana, who is going to be the moderator for this very important discussion. Um, Ana is the co-host of the Latinx Mental Health Podcast as well as the Program and Research Coordinator of Girasol, Texas. Um, in the podcast, Ana and fellow co-host Alejandra talk to therapists, researchers, artists, activists, and students about their experiences in the intersections of mental health and Latinx identity. Ana holds a master's degree in Latin American studies, as well as social work from the University of Texas at Austin. Her advocacy, social work practice, and research are centered around work with immigrants in detention centers and undocumented immigrant communities. And we're so happy to have you here with us. Thank you, Anna, for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here with amazing panelists to have an important discussion today. And I'm so glad Anna reached out uh, to us about being able to collaborate across the country um, on some of these really important talks. So thank you very much. Um, I am really excited to have the folks here today introduce themselves and share a little bit about their backgrounds um, and a little bit about the work that they're doing and then we'll just dive on into some of these topics. So if we can start with Patricia, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hola, my name is Patricia Dogmet. I am Associate Professor in the Graduate School of Public Health here at the University of Pittsburgh. I've been in Pittsburgh for 29 years. For 22 of those years, I've worked with the community in research, and especially in social relationships and health and access to care, how, how people manage to get care and in difficult circumstances. I also do a lot of community work Right now, I am the president of the board of Casa San Jose, which is an organization in Pittsburgh. And other important data, I have five cats. With that, I leave it there. Awesome, thank you. I think the last part was the most important. <laughs> um, especially in these times right now, our pets are so important. Um, Diego, I would love to have you introduce yourself next, if you could tell folks a little about yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. My name is Diego chavez Seneco. Buenas tardes. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Pediatrics at the School of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. I came to Pittsburgh uh, 22 years. I am a pediatrician by training, have a, a master in public health from the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. And um, 18 years ago, we created the program Salud para Niños. And Salud para Niños are the three words in Spanish for health for the children. And actually, Salud is an acronym that stands for Students, Residents, Fellows, Faculty, and Latinos United Against Health Disparities. So one of the goals of our program is to address barriers to healthcare access. And by addressing those barriers to healthcare access, we're addressing uh, healthcare disparities. So for example, some of the things that we do to our program is that we have uh, weekly free clinics um, uh, one uh, at Casa San Jose the, uh, on Tuesday mornings. And then the second side of the month, we go to the south side of Pittsburgh uh, to the Birmingham Clinic. Uh, we also put a lot of emphasis on prevention. Uh, we work on injury prevention. We do car seat checks, uh, vehicle prevention, helmets for bikes, uh, lead uh, screening. 
We also have a literacy program, uh, early literacy program where we give books starting at six months of age to all the kids that we see in our clinic. These are bilingual books, culturally appropriate. And we try to advocate for the community. Um, we uh, have worked very hard over the last several months during this COVID uh, pandemic uh, because we felt that we are an invisible community, uh, not only at the regional level, but at the national level. Uh, we see on the news all the time that uh, Latinos are uh, some of the segments that are being hit the worst by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But yet, when you look, for example, at the numbers from the CDC or the state of Pennsylvania or even Allegheny County, they are only able to report uh, in 50% of the cases uh, that about race and ethnicity. So we're still you know, invisible. And when we're invisible, we're vulnerable. So we cannot address the problems of a community that is not being seen by others. So one of our job is to advocate for the community and to make sure that the community is safe and healthy. And by the way, I'll take this opportunity to wish everybody in this panel, as well as all the people who are listening to us to be safe and healthy through this pandemic. Gracias, Diego. Yes, I can definitely relate to what you're sharing here in Austin. We're also seeing a lot of similar trends and challenges. So. That's something I know we'll kind of dive into a little bit more, what you're seeing, what you're kind of doing in response. And I appreciate you sharing the, the bilingual education and seeing ourselves represented is so important. So thank you very much. Um, Daniela, I think you have some slides to share with us. So I'm excited for you to introduce yourself and talk a little more about your work and the organization you're with. Yeah, thank you for having me. Buenas tardes, almost buenas noches since the days are getting shorter. Um, my name is Daniela Garcia Subieta. I'm from Lima, Peru. Um, I've been in Pittsburgh for the last six years on and off. Um, I'm a therapist, a social worker. I got my master's in social work at the University of Pittsburgh um, with a uh, certification in gender, sexuality, and women's studies. Um, so that's a little bit of what my focus is in. Um, and I'm going to be sharing some slides about the organization I'm currently working at, which is Pittsburgh Action Against Rape. Uh, we are one of the oldest rape crisis centers in the country um, and just have a really rich history. And I'm going to be focusing on our clinical services, and that's, that's the department I work in. Um, but all of our services are trauma-informed and mental health is something that we take very, very seriously. Um, I am a bilingual therapist, so I provide therapy in English and in Spanish as well with the same um, therapeutic modality. So I'm just gonna share some slides about that. Okay. So this is again, just gonna be an overview of some of our services that we offer in the clinical department. Um, our objectives really are to provide support and healing and assessment through any, to anybody who has experienced uh, sexual trauma. So we treat kiddos as young as three, um, all the way up to um, adolescents. We treat teenagers, adults, older adults, um, really everything in between as well. And the modalities that we use are EMDR, cognitive processing therapy, and trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy which I'll um, explain in a little bit more detail. And we do also have a support group. Um, so our department is made up of 12 therapists, our clinical supervisor and our clinical director, Dr. Carlos Golfetto. Um, we provide time-limited trauma-focused treatment, um, really up six to nine months is up to a year if needed. Um, that's a little bit of what our format looks like. Um, and like I said, we do treat adults, we see kids, and when we treat kids in our counseling center, we see the whole family. So the modality that we use, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, includes treatment for a caregiver as well. Um, and we do also provide psychoeducational groups in the community. Now, these are different than our support groups, and I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit more detail. Um, our intake assessment is really intentional in that we try to get information clinically to make sure we're providing the right services, right referrals if needed. So this is a process that um, we try to, to be careful with and make sure that we are setting people up to do therapy with somebody who will be a good match for them. Um, like I said, these are the three modalities, therapeutic modalities that we use, all evidence-based. Um, uh, for trauma. So the first one is cognitive processing therapy. So this is a kind of therapy that was developed specifically to work with PTSD. So again, we provide 
trauma-focused treatment. I'm a trauma therapist. That's what I focus on. Um, and it really has to do with, um, it's, it's a child of cognitive behavioral therapy pretty much, but it's looking at specifically the processes that happen in trauma recovery and um, a traumatic experience. Um, we also provide EMDR um, if appropriate. Now this is a um, kind of body-based therapy. It's very somatic. Um, it uses bilateral stimulation, um, which I'm happy to explain more on if anybody's interested, but it's um, again, evidence-based treatment for trauma. Um, something that's important to know about our services is that they're fully free and we see people who are uninsured. So normally, um, you know, it would be expensive to see somebody who has or who needs a trauma therapist, specifically if they might want to do EMDR, it's a more specialized treatment, but we provide all of that for free. Um, TFCBT, which is uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Again, this is what we use for any of our kids and teens. Um, that's a little bit of what the format looks like. It includes psychoeducation. Um, but it's a lot of I, emotional identification and regulation um, and also giving the kids the opportunity to tell their story in a trauma narrative format. Um, that's just an example of a trauma narrative. I'm kind of flying through these because I know we're doing introduction quickly. Um, and then lastly, we do have our support groups. Now they are being held still virtually since we are not providing in-person services right now because of COVID. Um, but this is a really great way for people to get connected to other survivors. It's fully confidential, um, run by two therapists. It's not a processing group, so it's not necessarily a therapy group, but it is a support group. So it's a great thing to, to know about. Uh, all right, so I will stop sharing then. All right. Thank you, Daniela. It's so rare to have bilingual services that are free where you don't have to have insurance that actually focus on trauma and uh, we just have a handful here in Austin that can do that too so I so appreciate the work that you're doing and I'm sure lots of people will be excited to delve into learning more about it. Thank you. I think we're going to shift into Patricia sharing some slides as we open up a conversation about both some challenges to accessing mental health care and starting to think about some of the approaches y'all are using to build on some things Daniela shared from some of the educational or research end of things and kind of moving forward from there. So let's start with Patricia sharing some of that information. I know they said that uh, you're on mute is going to be like the quote of 2020. So I'll try not to yeah, <laughs> spread that I, around too I much today. Back. I know you saw it. You're good. <laughs> the other slides there, right? Okay. I call this carrying the weight of the world because this is a, a phrase that somebody said in our research, in our qualitative research. First, before going into the in, into the things we did in research, I would like to talk a little bit about our community and how it is composed. Uh, we don't know how many people we are. There are estimates with 26,800 to 28 or 30,000, we're around that area. That is 2.2% of the population, which is small. It's a very young population, 30% under age 18. And that's that kind of, puts us in how important it is to have people who can treat children, both mentally and physically. And we are very scattered. Actually, there are 130 zip codes in Allegheny County. 18 do not have Latinos. There are Latinos in all others. And there are more than 500 Latinos only in 12 of those. More than a thousand Latinos in two of those, which are Brookline and Beachview. In those, there are fewer than 2,000. So even when there is concentration, it's a small concentration. We have to really go places to find people. And that puts our, makes our work harder. In general, my work in research it's harder to find participants. I imagine that Daniela's work and Diego's work, that's why he goes places to find people to, to, to take care of them. And 
the services here are generally not prepared to serve our population. There are specific people who have organized things, some few organizations, but a lot not. And as Diego well said, we are invisible. Nobody sees us. So that's the setting in which we are. And I'm going to talk about work that was founded funded by the Etude Center, which is in psychiatry. Dr. Brent is the principal investigator. And out of that, we did an assessment of the health of the Latinx youth in this area. I have our team there. The main thing was to test some apps to prevent suicide, but we took the opportunity to study the stressors and the strengths of our community and how the environment affected them. We worked with 12 uh, providers in interviews and a number of children in focus group and you know, youth, 12 to 17, and parents of youth separately. So that's the data we have. And this is what we found. It's no surprise that we live in a harsh environment and there is social isolation, you know, this being scattered People say that nobody looks like you in most places. There are some schools where there are lots of Latinos, but there are other schools that have two Latinos. And then there are very few things that help you in the community. Most people tell you, oh, nothing. But then you start asking, what about your family and your friends and the church and this organization and that? And they say, yes, but at first they feel there's nothing. The anti-immigrant climate that we all feel for youth extends to bullying in schools. And sometimes there are adults that tell them ungracious things as well. In addition, the environment in the home makes it hard if you have a mental illness or if you, have, you are feeling emotionally uh, weak because being having a mental illness is a sign of weakness for many parents and they don't want the children to be weak. And some families are not used to the notions of mental health that we use in the United States. So there is a disconnect there and the weight of the world. And that's what somebody said, referring especially to all these age inappropriate responsibilities that kids have. I found that kids are you saw them very young. They say they work in what do you work? Construction. Oh, yes. And they work in those things, and not only in construction, to get money for their houses because their families need the money. It's not to go to the movies, it's because the families need that money. And they, some cook in the house. So they have more duties than the regular teenager. In addition, they have to guide their parents through the US system, not only interpret, but explain to them what does it mean. It's not translation only, it's cultural translation. And they fear that they themselves or their parents could be deported because several kids that we saw, not everybody was the same, but some of them had parents that were undocumented and the kids were afraid for that and they have parental expectations. The parents also have the same problem, the anti-immigrant situation, and they want to show everybody in the US how Latinx are good people. They are strong, they can excel in school, they can be good kids, and the children feel that they have to fulfill those expectations. That's caring a lot, they have to they are under all these stress and obligations and they have to be perfect, which is very hard. That, that uh, results in the feelings that they have. I don't belong here. I, uh, I am afraid, uh, I am mad. They feel lonely. And how do they respond with it, to this? They hold in. They, many of them said that they don't tell. And this was pretty emotional in the focus group. They don't tell their parents because they want to protect their parents from being more worried than what they are. And that, that was worried me, but they, they want to protect their parents. Or a couple said that if they told their parents, their parents would say, that's nothing, you don't have anything. 
Some of them, some ties have a lot of uh, gastrointestinal uh, symptoms because of that, and some resort to self-harming, cutting themselves. That was very striking. When seeking care, I said here may not be an option because of the cost and the insurance. It is hard to find somebody who speaks your language. Not all the kids speak Spanish or English. Some of them speak indigenous languages better. Some of them speak only English or only Spanish. And the parents may say, if there's nothing, you don't have anything, why are you, we going to take you to the therapist? This is very hard for the kids. We also found incidentally, and this is important, that kids prefer personal relationships, but they are very tech savvy, all of them. So because of this, we tried to get a solution. And this came because the same uh, program, ETUDES had a innovation cost contest for therapists and Claudia Melendez Ardiles had an idea of doing a support group. This was in person originally. We are doing that now. And it's called Cuenta Conmigo, Count on Me. The idea is to promote mindfulness. She is uh, uh, teaching the kids some mindfulness techniques and we want to promote connections and taking uh, this preference for personal connections. And they've been tech savvy, but now the groups are in Zoom because of the pandemic. And we have also a WhatsApp group, a closed WhatsApp group for them to communicate between groups. The groups are every two weeks. The first one was yesterday. There were 14 kids there and they are healthy youth. We haven't, uh, well, I don't know, I haven't diagnosed them, but we have searched youth in the community, not people that are diagnosed. It's a preventive thing. It's not treatment. And, and we'll see how this is. But this is only a little thing that's providing, trying to provide some help for kids that are already in a very hard situation. So that's not all of it. And, we hope it's successful and we can evaluate it. But eventually, I think that we need to continue doing other stuff. As I'm sure everybody does. I know Daniela does. Diego just mentioned that too. And I know he does. We have to listen to the community to support it and advocate it. This picture is from a couple of years ago in the Rodef Shalom Temple for the uh, Pittsburgh Interfaith Impact Network. And we were advocating for immigration reform at that time. Well, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That was wonderful. Um, I so appreciate the way in which you kind of walk us through how you listen to even create this in the first place, right? And that oftentimes, you know, researchers come in with their own ideas. So I think it's really beautiful when it is more community driven from the start. I just want to touch on, you know, some of the highlights of what you said thinking about, you know, how do we come at this from the perspective of prevention, right? I think that is another thing that oftentimes is harder to fund than interventions. But again, it's just so important that we're not waiting until things get bad to do something about it, right? I think also kind of speaking to the diversity in Latinx communities and to some of the adversity faced in addition to being spread out. And that might be reflected in other communities and it might resonate with folks and then in other places where there's a stronger Latinx population, you know, there's other different types of challenges. And so I think for us to keep that conversation going and learn from one another is so valuable. Um, I also just want to sort of highlight for people to look into the research around code switching. So I think you sort of alluded to that idea of being cultural navigators as well as language navigators and there's just such fascinating work being done on that topic and so helpful to learn about so putting that out there for folks and just thinking about now that question right of how do we bridge how do we bridge this gap of the U.S. system we're navigating and making sure things are accessible and approachable right for families who might have confusion or concern or stigma or really well-grounded fear, right, of everything happening in the world right now. So I think that, you know, your, your point here, I'd love to hear Diego and Daniela maybe add some of what they're seeing in terms of challenges or how their approaches are working as well. And I wanna start with Diego because Patricia, I think you really pointed out, 
you know, if we have 30% of the Latinx population in Pittsburgh under the age of 18, the was working with children, you know, I'd love to hear how that's going and then kind of transition to going back to Daniela and your work. Thank you. So um, I'm going to share some slides about what we do and how can we incorporate what we do instead of like segmenting just mental health. Um, I did in the introduction talk about myself. I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I also have a fellowship in developmental behavioral pediatrics. So I wear a couple of hats. So three days a week I do general pediatrics and I see uh, mainly Latino kids, but also two days a week I see kids on my specialty uh, where families, not only Latinos, and as a matter of fact, Latinos are the minority, come to consult uh, for concerns with uh, questions, for example, with autism, uh, with developmental delays, with learning disabilities, and that's kind of like well, some of the hats that I wear. So um, I'm gonna be sharing uh, these slides. Um, just bear with me while I try to do this. Okay, here we are. Okay, perfect. So basically, uh, as I mentioned during the introduction, we created this program 18 years. Uh, and one of our goals is to make a difference in the community by addressing uh, barriers to healthcare access and by addressing those barriers, addressing disparities. Um, so basically, quickly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the programs and methods, results. And I wanna focus on the last slide, which is specifically about mental health and some of the things that other the um, presenters has already touched bases. So as I mentioned before, the goal for our programs is to reduce health disparities, combat social isolation. Isolation, by the way, is one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of uh, mental health. It is an issue here in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County in southwestern Pennsylvania because we don't have a neighborhood, we don't have a barrio. So people live uh, very distant, very isolated. When I first came to Pittsburgh 22 years ago, it was like a big deal to find somebody in the grocery store speaking Spanish and you approach them because you were kind of like craving that uh, social communication. That has changed a little bit. Uh, there is more Latinos in, our, in the region, but we still, as I mentioned at the beginning, invisible. And as a matter of fact, one of my concerns with the pandemic was that we were asking uh, people to isolate or to keep distancing. So in many of my presentations about COVID-19, I have crossed that word social distancing and replaced it for physical distancing. So we don't want people to be socially isolated during this pandemic. We want people to maintain social links but yet to make sure that they maintain that physical distancing that is so important for uh, the pandemic. We partner with many community agencies, including Casa San Jose, the Birmingham Clinic. We try to uh, uh, collect systematic uh, some data about what we're doing and we create an ideal environment for developmental screening. And developmental, by the way, goes hand in hand with behavioral health. So the clinic, as I mentioned before, was created 18 years ago as a medical home. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term medical home, the medical home was a term that it was created to the American Academy of Pediatrics. And the idea was to solve all the needs for all our patients, that the patients could come to our clinics and to um, our offices and look for any type of health, regardless whether it was specifically medically, it was specifically about illness. I'm putting a lot of emphasis on prevention. It started as a, a resident catch grant with the support from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And over years, we have uh, partnered with many organizations, as I mentioned before, the Birmingham Clinic, Casa San Jose, and we use a mobile unit that I will show you some pictures uh, in a few minutes. And the idea is to increase prevention and empower the community to address its own health. So some of the things that we're doing is that we have this um, bilingual bicultural clinics now in Oakland in our primary care center. Basically we're seeing kids here who have health insurance and infants and newborns. It's every Tuesday morning, afternoon, every Thursday morning, every Friday morning. This is staffed by Spanish speaking physicians. We have a phone line, we have nurses, we have um, registered people who are uh, fluent and are bicultural and bilingual. And by the way, one of the questions uh, that um, it was being asked about how to reach the community, the importance of sharing the culture. So it's sharing the language, but it's sharing the culture as well. Um, and we were the first line in uh, Allegheny County and in Southwestern Pennsylvania locally that provides service for the Spanish community. So people can call this phone line and we will help them to get service and to get access regardless of health, health insurance. Um, we have uh, uh, two free clinics now running on. We have the free clinic, the second uh, start of the month at the Birmingham Clinic. Uh, at the Birmingham Clinic, the Tuesday morning is at Casa San Jose. I will show you soon uh, slides about that in a minute. We partner for the program from the shared population, community support, University of Pittsburgh. One of the things that we're trying to do is make it integral. These clinics are um, interdisciplinary, so we usually have as part of these clinics not only 
uh, doctors, but we have, for example, uh, dental uh, medicine students, we have uh, lawyers, and we have social workers. And the idea of the social workers is to provide some screenings and assess the needs for these uh, families and actually refer us for mental health. Um, and this is the clinic that we have um, now in Casa San Jose. We're doing it every Tuesday morning. And this is the new model unit. You're going to see pictures from the old model unit and the brand new model unit. This new model unit was just donated this year uh, by the Ronald McDonald Charities in uh, conjunction with the Penguins, the uh, NHL uh, sport team. And it's very interesting. Um, you will see the difference. This one's actually pops out. So we have more room in the clinic compared to the old one. This is the old clinic that we had, the old model unit. Uh, the original work with us from 2001 until 2018 and uh, 19, I'm sorry, since 2020, we have the new uh, model clinic. And the idea of this model clinic is to increase room availability to track medical records, and as well as uh, to address some of the barriers, including uh, transportation, as many have mentioned, uh, one of the issues. Uh, we go outside of the community. I also feel that um, I'm a doctor, not for the exam room, but a doctor outside of the exam room. And of course, when you do that, you make the community more comfortable talking about their needs, their mental needs, all what they need to have. So this is an event that actually Patricia organized, uh, the Latino Fair, uh, um, I, I believe this was 2002, 2003. And as a matter of fact, uh, the doctor that you see here in the blue shirt, this is Roberto Ortiz Arguello. He's a triple board. He's a child psychiatrist, an adult psychiatrist, and a pediatrician. And he worked for, with us for many years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Children Hospital of Philadelphia took him from us uh, two years ago. So he's now in Philadelphia. But this is some of the things in terms of advocacy and reaching out to the community. And I want to put emphasis that when we think about mental health, of course, it's addressing the needs of the community and addressing illness, quote unquote, but it's more important than, than that is putting prevention and addressing wellness. So some of the things that we have done in the past is programs like football para niños, soccer for the children, soccer for the family. And the idea with this program was to convey the message that everybody could play. Uh, I think uh, one of my coworkers, my colleagues was putting the emphasis how wonderful was this picture to see the mom playing with her heels at the same time with the kids. A lot of the times in the current culture that we live in the United States, you know, you cannot play a sport if you're not a member of a fancy league and you play uh, very expensive uh, fees for being part of that league. And if you have fancy shoes and fancy uniforms, well, the message with this program that within the community was no, in order to be active, in order to, to promote wellness, in order to promote uh, well um, uh, health, mental health, you don't need to have fancy things. You don't need to participate in uh, fancy leagues. You just need to have your family. We put a lot of emphasis on education. I'm just gonna go quickly to these slides on education. Um, uh, I mentioned at the beginning um, our program for um, early literacy, and I want to get to the slide that I want to show you. These are some of the numbers we're seeing about, uh, we have in our program about uh, 1,250 kids, and we're seeing about 1,800 visas a year. By the way, being 2019, the busiest year in our program, because this is the year that we have seen the most increase in people who are uninsured. So while you read all the time on the news that people don't have health insurance, is happening. And I don't want to even want to think what is going to happen in about three to four weeks when the Supreme Court um, reviews the Affordable Health Act. A lot of people are going to be losing health insurance. And with that, they're going to be losing access to many health services, including mental health. So the slide that I wanted to get uh, was this one. And it's um, Patricia mentioned uh, Claudia Ardile. So I mentioned that one of the goals from our program is to be uh, integral. So about five to eight years ago, we hired Claudia Ardiles. Claudia Ardiles is a, a social worker, therapist, a counselor who is embedded in our clinic, in, primary, in the primary care center. And we're able to refer all the kids that we see in our clinic to her. And one limitation that we have is that it's just her and she has a limited number of sessions and she cannot see more patients or more visits that which she's actually seeing. So, you know, if I was gonna show you that the needs of mental health have increased, or the last four years or, or during this pandemic, I couldn't because the number of appointments are the same. We did this review of cases of the diagnosis that she was seeing uh, prior to the uh, presidential election of 2016 and after the presidential election of 2016. And what it struck us is how the diagnosis changed. So prior to 2016, the majority of the cases that she was seeing were things like ADHD in less uh, amount and adjustment disorder, anxiety. And after 2016, the cases have seen increase in terms of adjustment disorder, anxiety, separation anxiety, uh, depression, PTSD. And this is even before the pandemic. You cannot even imagine how the numbers are going to be after the pandemic. So I want to mention this, some of the work that Claudia Ardiles does in our practice. We also have as part of the free clinic um, the uh, possibility to refer uh, to uh, psychiatrists and the psychiatrists provide free care. 
And the idea is to promote and uh, this in a way that is not feel stigmatized. I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk in this panel about how mental health can be stigmatized in the community. And I wanna make a parallel this, and you have heard me talking a lot about COVID-19, but we cannot do this without talking about COVID-19. Uh, one of the things that we do in our clinic is that we uh, screen for social determinants of health. And one of the questions that we have in our electronic medical records is somebody having problems with food insecurity. And if you ask somebody, are you having problems with uh, having food? Sometimes it's really difficult for families to admit that. We have uh, little boxes of non-perishable food that we can give to families. But um, what I have found that is uh, it's hard sometimes for, so for families to admit that. So it's a good way to kind of get the intro. So saying that, you know, these are difficult times for everybody. Everybody's struggling. I'm struggling. I have a six-year-old that for a while I had to do virtual learning and it was really hard on me and my wife. And while we might not have problems with employment or uh, income, uh, we're exposed to risk. And actually when I'm talking about risk, I talk about the families, what do you do for a living? Are you in construction? Are you work in a restaurant? And if somebody says, oh, I work in a restaurant, guess what? You and me, we're in the same boat. These are high risk uh, jobs that we're doing because I'm seeing patients all day, all day and you're seeing customers in the restaurants all day and that put us at high risk for COVID. So putting things at the same level, sharing that concern that we have and actually taking the stigmatization. So when I ask about, do you need help with food? Do you, are you doing okay? Maybe you need some financial support to pay the rent and maybe I can give you a referral to Casa Jose. The same way about mental health. So I, for example, tell them, this hasn't been easy for me. You know, the same way that the election of 2016 was not easy for me. Uh, they generate a lot of anxiety. You know, I was depressed for a while. Similar to that is happening with COVID. And this is all the things that will happen. And actually taking away those numbers, because when we talk about depression or anxiety, people put up pause and it's like, wait, wait, I'm healthy. That's not me. But you know what? I'm concerned and nervous. I worry that me or somebody in my family might get COVID. I'm worried. I'm concerned about what is going to happen a week from now. Are they going to close us back again? I worry about my job. I might have a job today, but who knows? I might not have it tomorrow. So bottom line, so many concerns and so many ways to put this on late terms that is not just affecting some, it's affecting all of us. And again, putting emphasis on prevention and well-being. Thank you, Diego. That's so important. I think hearing providers especially normalize some of these challenges right now breaks down so many barriers, right? And I think that piece, you know, there's a power dynamic, there's a privilege that happens with having a license or degree or something like that, right? That, you know, when you're able to connect in that way, I think that's so powerful. Um, and I just wanted to note, I think too, one of the things we're talking about here in our community is we do have that increased isolation because of social distancing that we should be calling physical distancing, as you mentioned. And one of the things that comes up with that is the gaps in technology access too. So I don't know if that's something y'all are finding as well, but thinking about how do we also work together to find some solutions around all the many ways in which we need to find connection and can create connection, given that some of those pieces also have to do with what we have access to in terms of even just the devices or the Wi-Fi, some stable connection in that way as well. So um, just kind of wanted to bring that up there and name it as well. Um, and I also wanted to mention just this integrated care model. You're talking about how valuable it is to have physical and mental health be something we understand together, thinking about somatization and how if I can tell someone, okay, well, I have this pit in my stomach instead of saying I'm anxious, you know, it communicates something different. It's more accessible. So how do we continue to think about that kind of language? So on that note, you know, I really want to bring in Daniela. And um, I, I also, you know, was thinking about the social work phrase of meeting people where they're at. And Diego, y'all going out in your in your vehicle to literally do that. And um, so I think that's so that's such an interesting thing to kind of look at it that way. So let's bring it to Daniela. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on some of these challenges and approaches as well. Any thoughts you have as Diego is starting to bring up stigma, I think that's so important. So happy to hear kind of what you're seeing as well here. Yeah, oh, I have so many thoughts. Um, I think when I was first starting to try and conceptualize um, the idea of challenges and barriers, um, even not even about mental health care, but just in general, um, I think it would be a big disservice to not just the community, but even ourselves as professionals to not think about oppression and intersectionality and how we bring that approach into 
our solutions, right? Because when we're talking about the Latinx community, we're not talking about a monolithic community. Are we talking about international students at Carnegie Mellon or University of Pittsburgh? Are we talking about, um, you know, undocumented folks who have been here for six months and, you know, who don't have insurance? And so there's just such a big gap and we are not in one bag. And I think that's kind of what I kept coming back to is saying, well, we need to first make sure that we're considering oppression and the intersection and social location, because that's going to vary so much in our service provision. Um, right. It's not the same thing to be uh, a trans woman who also happens to be a black Latina, right. Versus a, a kiddo in a school. And so um I think that's just something that I, I don't want us to lose perspective of and, and, and think about. Um, and obviously, you know, within that we run, start to run into some of the issues that have been brought up before, which is the, the kind of more intersections that somebody finds themselves at, the bigger the gaps, right? And so I think the insurance gap is a huge uh, issue right now, right? If you are a grad student and you are Latinx and you're experiencing depression and you get your insurance through the university, you, that's a total game changer compared to um, some of the other, other parts of the community that we see. So I think that's something that we again need to just uh, keep in mind. Um, even as far as, you know, bilingual services, I, I've only been here six years, but even in the time I've been here, I've seen it change. I've seen it grow. Um, you know, we have service provision, we have service coordination, um, and we have providers. And so I think it's a matter of continuing to build that community, continuing to keep in touch. I mean, we have a committee through DHS that I know Patricia and Dr. Diego are also part of right, where we collaborate, we come together, we talk about what's going on at your agency, what are you offering, and we stay connected. But, um, you know, this shifts. Even this week, I found out about this other practice that, oh, has two other Spanish-speaking providers, and I was like, whoa, I have never heard of them. Okay, great, let's write it down, and, you know, we call, we connect. Um, and, and I think behind all of this is the fact that, you know, we know through research that whether it's mental health care or other care in general, receiving services in your native language is just a better practice. It's going to lead to better results clinically and, and health-wise. Um, and so, you know, this is really interesting to think about when we're trying to talk about not just trauma, but even just mental health in general. I mean, think about some of the core experiences you have had and some of the most shaping experiences you've had. Sometimes we don't even have language for it, right? If it's something that happened in childhood. Um, so how we know that memory works and thought association, right? We The language that we give to experiences is very much a developmental concept. And so if you, you know, have to talk to somebody who is not your age, doesn't speak your language, doesn't look like you, it's going, it's, you tally up all of the barriers, right? And so I think, um, you know, that's something that, that we also have to, to keep in mind. Um, obviously, working through interpreters, I mean, if we have it, great. And if we need to use them, then we use them. Um, but even that is still a gap, right? There are still folks who are not provided necessary interpretation um, medically or even you know mental health wise. And so again, it's kind of a, a constant uh, struggle that we're having to, to field and to navigate. Um, and kind of you know what uh, Diego was talking about with um, their provider, their behavioral health provider, we're all booked <laughs> all the time because there's not that many of us, right? And so it's Again, always having to figure out well, who do we refer to, where do we send folks. Um, healthcare is really expensive, and again, having that anti-oppressive lens, um, we need to look at well, you know, what is what is the the status of our political climate? What is you know exactly like what you were talking about, Diego, with the Affordable Care Act? I mean, what is it actually going to mean for people to lose insurance? The few people that already have to access healthcare to, through their insurance. I mean, these are all, yeah, these are all kind of the thoughts that have been going through my mind thinking about the challenges. 
Um, and then also the fact that a lot of times interacting with the mental health care system because it's so industrialized also means interacting with the system, right? Law enforcement, CYF, which is our, our local uh, child protective services agency, um, even hospitalization. What does this mean for families who are undocumented, right? What anxiety does that cause? Oh, do I disclose that my child experienced something really hard and get them help? When I know that that means exposing myself to the system. Uh, and if I'm undocumented, I mean, that's a huge risk. So again, just some of the things that um, are coming to my mind, thinking, thinking about the challenges. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> hmm? It's layered. <laughs> it is so layered, yes. Well, and like you said, I think that oppression lens is so important. So I appreciate you naming it and kind of adding on to that idea of social determinants of health Diego brought in and sort of naming some of those additional pieces there. And I also just think it's so great that y'all are already working together and that you're kind of giving this example of how do we collaborate and coordinate and seek new resources and be in touch. And I think that is part of how we look at those gaps, right? And create a web, you know, that can traverse all these different spaces and areas so that slowly we, we build up those coalitions. And I hope everyone who's listening who is um, either a mental health practitioner or a student studying takes this as, you know, an opportunity to be motivated to continue in this work and know that you know, you will be someone who hopefully can be seen in the eyes of someone you work with as relatable in a really special and unique way. So I'm really appreciative that y'all are bringing the importance of that forward. Um, I really want to, you know, take the last, we have got about 13 minutes left. I wanna cover a couple more things, but I just wanna name that earlier Patricia really focused a bit on some of the strengths-based pieces and I feel like oftentimes in these conversations, because things can feel dire, we may get a bit deficit-based or focus on challenges. And they're important to know and understand and discover, but also just don't want to pass by the resilience that I know is so present in our communities. So I invite y'all to you know, bring that into some of the other pieces if you would like here, because um, I know we see it every day and it's good to name that too. Um, but I'd love to go around and just kind of have you share a bit if you'd like to about, you know, what are you doing as, as a practitioner, as a researcher, as a professional to really take care of yourself, your family, your community? You know, how are you conceptualizing that right now in the midst of all of the political unrest in the midst of the pandemic? What does that look like for you? So I will start. Um, for me, it was really important to take action. So um, again, I'm sorry bringing up so much the pandemic, but I think that's one of the most important things that we have right now. When we had the uh, governor order uh, to stay home uh, back in March, uh, it caught my attention right away that the information that we were receiving was not provided in Spanish. Uh, the uh, impaired, hearing impaired community in Pennsylvania is about 8%, which is very similar to the percentage of Latinos in uh, Pennsylvania. To this day, uh, almost October 1st, uh, the releases that the Department of Health of the state and the county, Allegheny County, is still not providing interpretation in, in Spanish. We do see sign language for uh, human impairment, uh, but we don't see it uh, for um, the many Latino uh, uh, members in our community and our state and our counties. And that worried me a lot. And um, definitely it affect my mental health um, and I needed to do something about it. So it was moving from, okay, I'm concerned we need to take action. So we made a big effort and we had to go through a lot of um, approvals uh, through the healthcare system and through the university, through UPMC, to make sure that we were able to provide a webinar in Spanish for the community about COVID-19. Um, and with that, you know, I, I think it did help my personal uh, mental health, but also I feel it make a big difference uh, with the community. Uh, it's still concern, you know, so things are kind of relaxing, measures are relaxing, and um, people are thinking that the pandemic is over and the pandemic is not over. And we have been telling people for six months that it's not okay to do quinceañeras, it's not okay to do a big celebrations, and yet we're back again. And you know, I'm very concerned about what is gonna happen over the next uh, six months. But instead of staying concerned, you know, let's move to action. So I really appreciate uh, Anna and the staff who put together this webinar because that's a way to move from action. And this is good for all the panelists' mental health, but for the community mental health. So let's move to action. Let's do something. 
I've been putting a lot of emphasis that we need to make sure that our boys are here. We need to stop being invisible. And how we're going to be doing that? By completing the census. The census, I believe, ends tonight, if I'm not wrong. So if anybody is listening to this webinar, I have not completed the census. You still have a few hours to complete it. Please do it. Complete the census. How can we make ourselves not invisible? Voting. All of those who are listening to this webinar and other citizens, please make your voice heard. Go and vote. So, you know, being active definitely makes a difference. Making sure that our community is less invisible makes a big difference. So, and then by the way, and this might not have too much uh, related to mental health, but it does also help me because it's something else that we can do and it's um, active, uh, get your flu shot. So make sure that everybody gets your flu shot this season. <laughs> I would like Thank to go you. after that. I, that was fantastic, Diego. And I would want to tell Diego something I'm very happy that your Masters of Public Health is in use every day. So that's wonderful. I think that, yes, we need to take action. Those actions are all good. For my part, most of the work is what we do with Casa San Jose, and it is kind of work, but it's sort of fun and it has a purpose. But I need to feel connected to the people, so I did go to the distributions of food and money that they had because that made me feel more in contact with the people. I think that they could have done without me, probably, but I, I felt better by doing that. Those things are good. Also, I, I have students, I teach uh, graduate students, and talking with them, we only see each other in Zoom, but talking with them, asking how they're doing, and how we are all forgiving now, I am also forgiving. If somebody forgot to prepare something for today, well, that's okay, let's reschedule, let's change it. I think that those things probably help other people and help me to feel better because I mess up every day. And another action that I think that's very important is this Hispanic Heritage Month. All this organization of with, with Gina Garcia has been the lead, but Anna has been a big part and lots of people have been working on it. It was hard to, to pull off all this uh, programming and that's action. And I feel more connected to the people that have been doing this thing than before. So that's, and, and thank you for that. I'm sure there are more things, petting my cats. <laughs> I can go. Um, <laughs> I think uh, as far as some of the, the self-care for me, it has just been, um, I think just trying to be aware of what this experience has meant, what it's held. Um, I am not a citizen, so I can't vote. So I feel very, uh, like my hands are tied, I wish I could. Um, so I think just staying in touch with myself has been very helpful and um, connecting as much as I can with my family, my friends, all of, yes, Patricia, I love that background. <laughs> um, all of my, um, yeah, all of my people and encouraging my clients to do the same. I mean, I think this has been such a humbling experience for providers where, I mean, exactly like, like what Diego was saying, like we're on the same boat. And so really using that uh, to like strengthen the therapeutic alliance and saying like, hey, this is normal what you're experiencing normal. You're stuck in fight, flight, freeze because we have a constant threat on us. Normal, right? Um, and so I think strengthening that rapport has been really humanizing. And um, I think something you touched on, Anna, before we started recording was um, how westernized mental health is, how white it is. And, and I think that's a struggle for me, right? And how sanitized it can be. And so taking this as an opportunity to say, like, we have something very much in common right now. I'm not gonna make it about me, this is your treatment, but I'm a human being too, and we can connect on that. Um, that's been really, I think, life-giving as well. Um, so yeah, those are a little bit of the things I've been doing. Absolutely, I think that breath is so helpful, right? Because that sort of stepping in and out and like kind of caring for different pieces, I think is so important. And oftentimes self-care and community care get separated, right? And I think for so many of us, that feels super weird because 
caring for one another is caring for ourselves and vice versa, right? Like doing the work is part of that like rewarding piece. And also it's okay to like make sure we get enough sleep and all the things, right? Like we don't lose that either. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, making sure we're not kind of, that's also a very sort of westernized like whitewashed approach to self-care. And so just really being in tune with like what feels good and intuitive to all of us, to everyone individually, to reaching in for connection always, you know, I feel like that's so important. And to your point about fight, flight, freeze, one of the biggest things I've been doing with people is just saying our brains are constantly scanning for danger, right? Like several times a second. Mm -hmm. So think about how often, you know, throughout your day, you're getting danger signals versus safety signals, right? And right now we're probably getting a lot more danger than safety. So how can each of us just find ways every day to add a little piece of safety, a little nugget? Mm -hmm. off fuzzy blanket that hug from your dog like calling a friend what what is something that sends your brain that signal of mm -hmm. safety that can counteract you know and how can we just start to incorporate that so I appreciate you bringing that in we don't have time to go into all the neurobiology today but it's all so fascinating and know, knowing is. the little nuggets right it like helps us put those pieces together yeah. so thank you yeah, of course so we have about five minutes left. We're wrapping up here and an hour always goes by so fast, but I feel like you've managed to pack so much good stuff in there. So thank you so, so much. Um, you know, we always end our podcast with the question, what is your favorite herb or tea? Because we always in person drink tea. We call it just like Abuela used to make because Alejandra, my co-host, uh, is an herbalist and always brings that into it. So. I do want to ask you that question, but as we go around, if you want to add any last nuggets of advice, cositas that you want to leave in, feel free to bring that in with your, uh, what is your favorite herb or tea? Um, so we'll go ahead and start this one with Daniela. Hmm. Um, I'll be honest, I'm a coffee drinker. I don't drink a lot of tea. Uh, so I'm going to go with ginger because that tends to be where I uh, mm. go to. Um, my, my nugget of advice is just going to be to take heart and try and stay focused and calm and know that things will pass, um, to keep doing our anti-racist work. I mean, we have so much work to, left to do in the Latinx community and the immigrant community to fight anti-Blackness. Um, so that's, that's going to be my nugget to keep doing, doing the work. Thank you, Daniela. Let's go to Diego for. Um, I want to thank Patricia for that comment about forgiveness. Um, I think it's really important for mental health to forgive yourself and to forgive others. Um, I want to thank everybody in this panel because this is part of, as I said before, my mental health of connecting or maintaining uh, social connection while keeping physical distancing. So thank you for everybody's comment. I really appreciate it. Like Daniela, I am Colombian. I don't know if I mentioned this before. But as any Colombian, Juan Valdez, I have to drink coffee. But if you really push me, you know, I also like yerba mate. I like, you know, the yerba mate from Peru, from Uruguay, from Chile, Argentina, and yerba buena, of course, which actually I was trying to remember how you say yerba buena in Spanish. Um, I can see faces of surprise. I don't know. Um, by the way, while people are thinking about that, I want to answer some of the questions in the, in the question uh, chat. Um, for people who are not Latino, a lot of the things that we said here, you know, it's true for everybody. Uh, Jorge Delgado says that is mint. I doubt that is mint. I think it's something else, but okay. I'll take that, Jorge. Thank you for, for sharing. Uh, for people who are not Latino and who are listening to us, a lot of the things that we talk here are not exclusively for Latino. When we say that we are in this together, we're truly in this together. Uh, so let's make sure that we all, thank you, uh, Anna Spermint. Let's make sure that we all take of, uh, care of each other, that we take care of ourselves, that we might um, stay connected, that we do the things that we need to do by uh, voting, uh, by uh, being active in whatever we do in our daily lives, you know, and uh, sometimes to be active, you don't have to leave your home. Um, and again, I kind of echo enough what Patricia said, forgive yourselves, forgive others, and let's be optimistic, let's positive. Uh, things are gonna go better, and hopefully there is a light at the end of the tunnel and things are gonna get better for everybody. And vote and get your flu shot. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. Patricia. I would say what they said is great, great anti-racism, forgiveness. Those are wonderful things. One thing I found recently that I'm doing, I go walks with my husband around. 
And now we know where the bunnies are, where the turkeys are. We know which tree is losing the leaves. So we are observing much more. And I think that's a good thing. We are paying attention to our surroundings in a way that we were not paying attention before. I think that that helps me. And, and of course, this connection is wonderful. And as far as tea, I do agree with ginger. I, I drink coffee too, but in the evenings I drink tea. I cut the pieces of ginger and boil them. Then I put hot water and then I put them in the fridge. My husband complains of all these uh, bottles of yellow stuff in the fridge. Anyway, <laughs> I drink that, but I found my favorite herb is basil. Mm -hmm. And if you put basil in your tea, it's also good. I like to have long stem glasses too. So this thing cold with tonic water, so ginger basil tonic, I would recommend to you. It's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Those are so good. And yeah, if anyone in the chat, I see some people adding some teas and herbs. So feel free to infuse our chat with all of the beautiful things you like at home. I think we have to get our resources where we can get them. And by, you know, I drink coffee too. I love coffee, right? So bringing in some of those warm or cold goodnesses is always so, so good. Did you have something, Patricia? Cedron is great. Somebody mentioned Cedron. Yes, yes. I all, I'm all for that. Yes. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank all of our panelists so much. I know we're at time. I don't want to keep folks over, but this has been an amazing, wonderful mm -hmm. discussion. Y'all are so knowledgeable and doing such important, impactful work. So it's really beautiful to hear about. It's so great to connect with you. I echo your hopes that we really learn from some things here about how to emphasize community, lean into that, lean into forgiveness and flexibility and, and hopefully have some more room, right, for all of us to be human at the end of this and for us to see our struggles as shared. So thank you for bringing that forward. I'm gonna pass it back to Anna. And I have just so enjoyed my time here today and I hope everyone learned a lot, got something out of this and can just feel all the love everyone has for you listening today. So Anna, you have an open invitation to come to visit us here in Pittsburgh yeah. whenever the pandemic is over. Thank you. I would love to take you up on that. <laughs> yes, Anna, you well, can stay, you can stay with me if you'd like. I have more than enough room. <laughs> I will be there. <laughs> yes. Um, I really want to thank all of you, all the panelists and moderator, for being here and agreeing to do this. It's such, um, you know, a important part. Uh, something I'm very passionate about is mental health and helping the Latinx community, and definitely moving here to Pittsburgh, um, finding that community has been difficult, but all of you are part of that and I so appreciate it. I wanna echo something Patricia said, which was that um, doing this work for Hispanic Heritage Month is part of that yeah. self-care and it's that action. And I've been so, you know, as all of us frustrated with everything that's going on and I've just been pouring everything into, <laughs> into this work. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy all of you could join us. Um, I also was nervous in the beginning of this uh, panel, so I forgot to introduce myself, but <laughs> um, my name is Ana Flores and I am a doctoral student in the School of Social Work and um, also a programming chair for the Latin American Graduate Organization of Students or LAGOS. And I also meant to just recommend that everybody take some time in their day to just pause, you know, stand outside, close your eyes, um, you know, rest them from all the computers and screens um, and drink your tea or coffee, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, so with that, I think we'll close. Um, I really want to thank everybody again. And um, I sent or I put a link in the chat for a resource page that I put together with the help of um, some colleagues. So go ahead and check that out and contact me if you know of anything else that we can add to it. Thank, thank you, you for everybody. Thank you. Meeting. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Of and thank Everyone you, Matt, has... for organizing the, the technology. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank Without you. which we would not be here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And thank you so much to the